Hi, my name is Nell Fortner, and I'm here today to interview Grover Higgs, a longtime women's basketball coach who's had a tremendous amount of success in the women's basketball game. Grover, you've been coaching for 47 years. It's a long time. Long time, Nell. And you're still here to talk about it. Barely, though. <laughs> you've been a part of a lot of victories. Let's talk seven junior high basketball teams that went undefeated. You were a part of nine high school state championships, 16 junior college panhandle titles, nine junior college regional titles. So we're talking about out of those 47 years of basketball coaching, you've had 45 years, I did the number count crunching, of, of pure excellence. You had 20 years where you finished your season with a win. That's unbelievable. So the obvious question here, Grover, is what has made you such a successful basketball coach? Well, I've been very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. Most of the places that I ever worked, I did some background work on, and I made a decision before I ever accepted the job that we could win at the highest level at that particular place. And if you check back to places I have coached, they had good teams and good programs before I went there. When I got there, I just happened to capitalize on what was coming, and we made better programs. Now, if you talk about personal things that, that I think has helped me, number one is I love the people that I work with. I love to be with those kids. I'm a touchy-feely person. I love the personal contact that most of these kids don't get. Um, they know that Coach Hicks can get on you, and in five minutes he'll be hugging your neck for something good you've done because I don't bear a grudge. We wipe the straight clean every day when we start the day. The Probably the, the least important of all is how good the talent of the kid is. But you've got to be able to take those kids and decide where they can play to help your team be better. You know, we had a situation this past year where we brought in a kid that was 6'3 and had never played away from the basket in her life. And the first thing we did is move her out to a guard position and she hit seven out of nine threes in the national championship game. Oh. And everybody thinks we're crazy because we were playing her out of position. No, we weren't. Everybody else had played her out of position. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that the willing to take risks and the willing to read your people for what they can contribute has been successful for me. Thank Excellent. You. you know, there's been a lot of great coaching duos throughout the history of women's basketball. Pat Summit, Mickey DeMoss. Gino Ariema, Chris Daly. Tara Vanderveer, Amy Tucker. You've got Rooney Scoval and Grover Hicks, right up there amongst the best. Why are you and Rooney such a good coaching duo together? Two reasons. One reason is I succumb all of what I think should be done to her. I may, I may push it through her, but I never disagree with her in the sense that it's going to cause a rift between us. When the, when the nut-cutting time comes, she's the one. I love that term, <laughs> nut-cutting time. You get right to it. Right to it. She's the one in, in all aspects of the game. And I accepted. See, in the beginning, I was the boss, and she was the... The, the student that was being mentored. And, of course, I don't call myself a student, but I am the assistant coach, and I will always be the assistant coach. Learning to play that role has been very, very integral. These people that you just named, the head coach has the easy part. <laughs> it's us assistant coaches that have a problem. How many times have you seen assistant coaches get so familiar with the program and the head coaching job that they started thinking they could do a better job than the head coach? They need to leave. Mm -hmm. That's when they need to leave. So we assistant coaches have to play our part, succumb to the head coach. The second thing is 
truthfully, most of the fundamental basketball that Coach knows she has learned with me, not mm -hmm. from me, but with me. We've learned together. We talked last night about some things we've learned, you know. Uh, I learn something almost every day, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's helped. Okay. You know, you've had, throughout the success you've experienced in your 47 years of coaching, you've had plenty of opportunities to leave Gulf Coast State College and move on to a higher level, Division I, um, as an assistant, make more money, have more glory, or, or however you want to put it. And you've turned those opportunities down. Why? I was very comfortable with where I was. I'm very comfortable with where I am now. I've, I'm at the end of my road. I'm looking back. I was basically looking back for the last five years. And some of the jobs that I have been offered or have negotiated with, there was no security for, for uh, me to to do what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I could. I know I can work with Coach. I've, mm -hmm. I, I, we've, I've been through that. I've explained that. But I don't know if I could work with somebody else. And I've not had an opportunity to take a head job that I thought was going to be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it may be a, a, a loser's end, you know. Uh, but I like Panama City. Uh, the people that hired us here were absolutely wonderful to us. And the people that have taken over are wonderful to us, too. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying in the, their best effort to help our program. And we, we're going to see some good things come along. Yeah. And I, I want to be part of it. Yeah. You know, there's a, a lot of coaches. You have a lot of um, coaching peers that hold you in high regard, tremendous amount of respect for how you do your job. And there's a few words that come to mind. Honesty is always the first thing out of coaches' mouths when I ask them about Grover Hicks. Trustworthy, loyal, genuine, warm-hearted, kind-hearted, firm. But those, those are words that are a general consensus of who you are on that floor. I want to take those words and think of two more. Coach and teacher. What is the difference between those two words? to you or is there a difference yes there's a difference people that can coach can coach without preparation they can make decisions without preparation that there's great business leaders that are great coaches because they can make decisions based on hunches based on past experience, based on feelings, as we call it in the business, the seat of your pants. A teacher can't do that. A teacher has got to have a structure system that they go through, that they take a person or a player through to get to a certain point. Coaching is you read it, you understand it, you know what to do. Coach used to get on me so badly when we first started because I didn't want to rehearse and, and, and choreograph too much of what we did in pressure situations because the kids are already nervous and if the people that you, if you learn to do certain things in pressure situations, your, your opponents are learning too. Look how much money they spend on video and scouting and, 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 and doing game prep and all this type stuff. Well, they're learning. We've actually played people in this league that knew our plays better than we did. Mm -hmm. We could call a play, and they'd call it right back and run it better than we could. <laughs> so you don't need to do too much preparation. Keep it fresh. Keep your kids understanding what you want. Somebody asked me the other day, said, when, when you want to call a play, what do you say? I said, I call the play. You know, if I want a double low pick and roll, that's what I want. I want a double low set and a pick and roll off of it. And it doesn't matter if you know that. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it. Right. Because that's what we're supposed to do. So the difference in coach and the difference in teacher, it would be preparation and instinct. Mm -hmm. Coaching is more instinct. Mm -hmm. There's teaching involved. Teaching is a whole lot less stressful than coaching.
but do you consider yourself a teacher or a coach? Oh, definitely first? a coach. A coach. Definitely a coach. Instinctual. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. If I had my choice, we wouldn't practice a damn day. <laughs> Not one day. Why is that? Explain that. We can go out there and learn to do it together. Mm -hmm. That's that's why. Okay. Kids are enthusiastic. You know, we burn kids out. We overcoach. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we overcoach as much as we overteach. Mm -hmm. We're getting back to that teacher yeah, coach bit. Right, right. You know, you know we don't give kids enough chances to make decisions. We're teaching them what decision to make too much. Yeah. Uh, um, Grover, one of your um, coaching peers, you have a lot of them, but Women's Basketball Hall of Famer Andy Landers. Very good friend. He's a, and he's a good man, excellent coach, has yeah, a absolutely. tremendous amount of respect for you. When I asked him just to, to tell me, give me a thought of Grover Hicks, and the thing that came first out of his, his mouth was, basketball is family to Grover Hicks. It is his family. It's every day he wakes up. It's not going anywhere. You know, those, whether it's Rooney that he works with, it's the kids that he coaches, it's his family. He lives it and breathes it and loves it. Is that a correct assessment? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Cost me two marriages and some happy <laughs> homes, but basketball has been on the forefront of my mind all my life. This morning, of course, I was planning to come in for this interview, but this morning I thought about basketball. One of our players went home uh, over the break and there was some traffic problems in the Atlanta airport and I was concerned about her. I asked coach, I couldn't wait to get to coach to ask her had, had she reported in. Uh, basketball is family. Yeah. Coach and I have been very, very close, as everybody knows. And it has been our family. It has been our child. Yeah. You know, we got these dogs and, and they're our babies, but they're not our children. Mm -hmm. These these girls are our children. And I've always been a, a player advocate and uh, Coach gets on me about that a lot. But I've <laughs> I've told her a few things. <laughs> I think you have, definitely. Uh, <laughs> but I would I would say that that, that is true, that basketball yeah. is definitely one of my family. Yeah. Carol Ross, who is an excellent coach, longtime good women's friend. basketball coach, good friend of yours, absolutely. Tried to hire you a couple of times. A couple of times. She just couldn't pull you away from Gulf Coast, though, that's <laughs> for sure. But she, some, she made these two observations, and I, I think they're excellent, and I want to hear your opinion on them. She says, Grover has mastered simplicity, number one. Absolutely. And number two, he can stir the souls of his players. He can see inside of them. What are your thoughts on those two things? Well, those are... Pretty good compliments, aren't they? <laughs> they are. But maybe maybe she would have given me a good check if I'd have taken one of those jobs. She'd have probably done like most head coaches and belittled me down there to the peons, you know, once I signed up. Uh, but I think she was talking about the game and your you you see the game in simple terms, right? And so you can relay it. We do we we, we complicate the game too much. It is a simple game. Yeah. There's only five things you can do on the court. And you've got to practice all of them enough to be proficient at them and mm -hmm. excellent at something. And there needs to be there needs to be something that you can do better than anybody else. Right. And if there's not, you better be pretty good at everything else. <laughs> and as far as being the soul and looking get, inside get to those the soul, players, yeah. I do feel that I have a gift to do that. I do feel that I understand. I don't hit on all of them, but I do most of them. Yeah. And most of them just want you to be fair with them and love them. Mm -hmm. And let them know that you don't evaluate them as people, as players. You know, there's some of those players. I have a favorite player on every team I ever coach. <laughs> and you know what? Everybody in the gym knows who that favorite player is. 
but I handle it in such a way that that favorite player may be the one I ride the most. Yeah. And most of the time it is. Yeah. But they got to know that they're my favorite player when I'm giving them hell now. You right. Can't, you can't just go out there and say, well, I'm going to make her my favorite player and just go to jumping on her and eating her alive. Yeah. They don't understand. Yeah. It takes time. And it takes something usually away from the basketball court to convert them. Yeah. Something you've done or, or helped them in some way. Do you think that some of that where you can, where you get that feel of you can see inside of those players and really stir their soul comes from those 5 a.m. study halls that you were always in charge of, still are? I mean, that's, that's early in the morning. <laughs> well, yes, uh, it is. And you get to see those kids in a different light mm -hmm. uh, when you're sitting there at the study hall with them. And uh, I have been promoted, though. I don't have to do the study halls anymore. <laughs> We're bringing Austin along <laughs> to, to try to get him ready to do study hall. Yeah. But uh, you, that, I do think that has helped me understand those kids. Yeah. I know that you love your bird dogs, and you do a great job training them. And, and uh, I got to, I was even fortunate enough to meet them, and I'm really, I, I feel good about that because I love dogs. But you're very dedicated to them and training them, and they're, and they're excellent in what they do. How has training bird dogs, is there a correlation between training them and coaching basketball? Absolutely, yes. I became a much better coach because of the, my introduction and relationship and friendship with a dog trainer. Leon Anderson lived in Evergreen, Alabama, out in the woods, and he was an old military man. He was a first sergeant, and he worked at Fort Leavenworth training guard dogs for the military when he was in the military for 30 years. He used to talk to me about training dogs and how it paralleled. And really and truly, the only difference is the IQ level and the communications that we people can make that we can't make with dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, very simple, very simple. Put them in a situation where they can't fail and they're going to succeed if they can't fail and then reward them. Put them in a situation they can't fail, reward them, and just keep rewarding them. Sometimes rewarding those kids is putting that arm around them and say, I love you. Sometimes I walk up to them, I say, does anybody ever tell you you weren't worth a flip? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have, Coach. And I said, don't you ever forget it either. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you got to reward them. Yeah. That's a reward. That kid loved that. She'll remember that a long time. Yeah. More than, that a girl. You know. Right, right. But they know you're sincere about absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I am. Yeah. And I am. Yeah. You have another good friend in this business, Jim Davis. Yes. Longtime coach at Clemson. Yes. And uh, knows you quite well. And um, he likes to say that Grover is comfortable in his own skin. And when I hear you talk about your bird dogs and where you learned, you know, you learned a lot of the things that you can translate and correlate to coaching, you're not afraid to do that. No. Nope. So you are comfortable. I mean, then it's true. You are comfortable in your own skin. Is that something that you've known, and maybe that's why you have stayed here at Gulf Coast for a long time? Probably. Probably one of the reasons I've stayed is I am so comfortable. Mm -hmm. But, Nell, there's a thin line between confidence and cockiness. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe with all my heart, all my heart, that I can walk in any gym in, the, in America including where Coach Geno's sitting, and I can hold my own with anybody there coaching. I just believe that. Yeah. That's constant. Cockiness is if I was out trying to tell everybody about it. Mm -hmm. Saw the Olympics the other night, and watched this guy harass Michael Phelps before they raced. And, of course, Michael beat his butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that on the world stage, this nut was psyching up the best swimmer of all time. Right. Not just that night, of all time. We do some silly things, yeah. don't we? That's cockiness. Right, right. He could have been very confident and sat there and might have won if he just hadn't really made a fool out of himself. <laughs>
Grover, has there ever been a player in all of your years of coaching that you couldn't reach, that you couldn't get the most out of? Yes, uh, we've had some uh, that we didn't get near out of them we should, and we didn't change their life. Uh, you know, they may have come around as basketball players, but they went right back to the street thuggery that they came from. Mm -hmm. And Lord knows that we've tried so hard, and we still try. And I swear, Nail, I believe kids are getting better. Maybe we're just recruiting a better clientele than we used to. Mm -hmm. but, but kids are not like they used to be uh, as far as just being so rebellious and thuggery. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they got their tattoos and they got their cell phones and, and they're camping out out there in left field, as we say. But they're, they're not bad people. Mm -hmm. And we used to have some bad people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some of them we didn't get to. I don't want to call any names, yeah. but there's some of them that we didn't get to. Yeah. Is that something that you would look back on and go, God, I wish I would have tried this or this. But basically, you believe in how you, you work with kids, and it just sometimes doesn't work. Coach will tell you that the first year she ever worked with me, I told them that my motto my life's rule is I want to treat every kid to where if I met them 20 or 30 years later and I shook hands with them, I could look them in the eye and say, I did everything thing I could to help you. And I mean that. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that. I don't know of one that I didn't do everything that I knew to do. Yeah. And I think in my coaching career, I've actually had two kids that I told Coach, I said, they got to go, yeah. and she agreed, of course, to yeah. anything I said, but we, yeah. we, that, that was here. I had one player, one guy in high school in all my coaching career that I had to cut. I just didn't get to him. Yeah. Is there anything else in your career that you strive for at this point in your career? <laughs> Is there any, anything else that you strive to accomplish? Not in a career. Not in a career. I, I want to, I want to have a good afterlife uh, after coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to enjoy doing some things that that normal people do, and not have to worry about oh, is the phone going to ring and one of our kids has done something foolish or one of them been in an accident or something bad happens. Uh, we just had a. A baseball player, ex baseball player, he got hurt, and it's just bad news, or got killed, really. And it's just bad news yeah. that you hate to hear. Yeah. And it's kind of like being a school principal. And all the school principals in the world, if there's anybody that ever hears this, I understand you. There's never any good news, it's always bad. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's kind of the way it is. Oh, isn't it funny how you said, as you were starting that last talk, I just want to have a normal life, be a normal person. Isn't that funny how we look at coaching? You're not normal. <laughs> it's just a hard, it's a hard business. It's tough. You can't lead just a normal life. Um, and so, would you look forward to, to leading that normal life? <laughs> Dude, I want to say one thing, one more thing. When I started student teaching, before I ever graduated from college, the first day or two I was at Op High School, <laughs> I went into the teacher's lounge, and I almost had a, I just almost had a heart attack. In that teacher's lounge, there was teachers sitting in there talking about going to the beauty parlor, <laughs> going grocery shopping, uh, going to the furniture store, didn't like that tablecloth they had. They were going to get another one. And you know, all of a sudden, Nell, for the first time in my life, I'm a grown man, college graduate, basically. Teachers are people. Teachers are people. Hell, I thought they stayed in the building over the weekend and guarded it till Monday. <laughs> Never entered my mind. Yeah. And that's the way people look at us coaches. We, that, yeah. We're so accessible to everybody for everything they think that's all in life we have, and, and to be successful, I guess it is. Yeah.
Well, and as a coach, you know, it's a 24-7 job. It's 365 days a year. It's 24 hours. You are on call the entire time. But what makes you so great, what makes Rooney so great, is that y'all are available at all times yeah. to your players. Yeah. And they know that. Yes, they do. Yeah, they know <laughs> they that. <do. laughs> they trust you and count on you. Well, Grover, it's been so nice sitting here chatting. And um, what a phenomenal career you've had. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. For sharing your story, a little bit of your story, because That's I know there's somewhere. a lot more out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot.